Okay, we're in Revelation chapter 8. Revelation chapter 8. The end of the world. <laughs> when, uh, when we got uh, into this last week, we, we went through and read it. Let's, uh, let's go through and, and read it again. I just want to um, do, do the, basically the overview of this stuff so that you can see um, kind of from a, uh, uh, an overview what's happening in the chapter because I'm, I'm going to end up uh, talking about that, um, tying everything together, uh, actually with some science. So Revelation chapter 8, um, we got down to the second trumpet, but let's start reading at the first trumpet and we'll just go through the chapter. It says, so the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. The first angel sounded and hail and fire followed mingled with blood and they were thrown to the earth and a third of the trees were burned up and all green grass was burned up. Then the second angel sounded and something like a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea and a third of the sea became blood and a third of the living creatures in the sea died and a third of the ships were destroyed. Then the third angel sounded and a great star fell from heaven, burning like a torch, and it fell on a third of the rivers and on the springs of water. The name of the star is Wormwood. A third of the waters became Wormwood, and many men died from the water because it was made bitter. Then the fourth angel sounded, and a third of the sun was struck, a third of the moon, and a third of the stars, so that a third of them were darkened. A third of the day did not shine, and likewise the night. And I looked, and I heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven, saying with a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth because of the remaining blasts of the trumpet of the three angels who are about to sound. Let's, uh, let's pray and, let's, and we'll get into it. Lord, um, again, we have our Bibles open, Lord. We thank you for the promise that you made in the book of Revelation that um, when we read these things, when we take uh, what you've said in the book of Revelation seriously, that there is a blessing that you pour out on us. And Lord, that's a blessing that we want. Um, thank you, Lord, for uh, the fact that you're a God who knows the end from the beginning. And when you speak things, um, whether it's today or whether it's thousands of years ago, when you speak things and, and say that they're going to come to pass, we know that that's exactly what's going to take place. Some of the stuff that we're uh, going to be talking about tonight is pretty scary. Um, but Lord, again, you're the one who's in control. You sit on the throne and you know what you're doing. And so, Father, uh, we just pray that as we're going through this passage, it, you'd help me to be clear and, uh, Father, that your uh, word would be glorified. You'd be lifted up, Lord. And we ask that you do this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so when you see the, the trumpet judgments, the trumpet judgments most likely start somewhere around the middle of the tribulation period. And I, I covered that um, not in great de detail last week, but, you know, somewhat. One, one of the things that you see with the tribulation period, seven years long, and it's divided up into two. And the division uh, happens with uh, what's called the abomination of desolation, where the Antichrist proclaims himself to be God, makes everybody take a mark, uh, defiles the Jewish temple, which by that time has to be rebuilt. And it looks like when you're going through the Bible, whether you're in the book of Daniel or whether you're in the book of Revelation or whether you're in the, uh, the book of Matthew and all the places that it's talking about last day's events, it looks like there, there's a consolidation period where the Antichrist appears at the beginning of the tribulation and then he's consolidating his empire. There's got to be a period of time that's relative peace. In fact, in the book of Daniel, it says he destroys many with peace. And so he, he rises out of warfare, but he's, he's the savior, basically, of the world. As far as, the, uh, as, far as people who don't know the Lord um, consider this guy. They think, they think that he's the second coming. They, you know, when he's called the Antichrist, he's a, he's a false Christ. He's a pseudo-Christ. He's a replacement for Jesus. And people consider him to be that to the point where by the time you get to the middle of the tribulation period, these people are willing to worship him. And we'll get into that when we get into a couple of chapters later in, in, uh, into uh, chapter 13. What I'm telling you is this guy is highly charismatic and he brings about changes on the planet that nobody else could, could bring about. And so the world is hailing him as, uh, as a dictator that they love, basically. And so, you know, when you, when you look at this, anytime that I'm talking about this stuff, I'm not surprised by some of the things that, go, that, that are going on politically. I'm not surprised. I'm not surprised when you got people who want to go to a more and more 
uh, confining system of government. You know, it's basically we want peace at any price, and so we'll give up rights. You know, so we have these, these situations where some wacko goes in and shoots up a school or something. And at that point, people just want to give up the whole gun right. You, you realize what gun rights are, are for. Second Amendment in the Constitution is to protect us against government. It's what it's for. And, you know, I, I got raised up in public school, and I got the same thing that kids get, get nowadays. You know, uh, the Second Man Amendment was, was, was not, uh, uh, basically it was about protecting yourself from Indians, and we don't have Indians anymore, or protecting yourself from bears, and we don't have bears anymore. And then at one point I'm in a government class and I have to read the Constitution, and I read the Second Amendment, and I'm like, this says I can have a bazooka. <laughs> you know, because it's, it's, it's specifically written to protect me against tyranny in, from the government. And so what we got is a situation where um, people are willing to give up rights to self-defense to a government so they can have a peaceful life, basically. And so I see that in those kinds of areas. And I'm not, I'm not making a, a statement one way or the other about that. That's just, that's just what happens with people. I think that there are going to be gun laws and they're going to be restrictive because we've got a whole society that can't control itself anymore. And so you can't have a situation where you've got a, you know, like a kid in the 50s putting his um, hunting rifle up in the rack in his truck and going to school anymore because the kids are nuts because there's no self-control. You, you throw out self-control... And you've got all kinds of problems with freedom. And so it, it's, it's got to be stopped one way or another. Either we change our hearts or the government controls us. And those are the ways that things go as far as historically goes. Um, Adams said that, that our Constitution is made for a religious and moral people, and it's wholly unsuited for any other. And so we're not a religious and moral people anymore, are we? And so we got, a, we got a situation where the things that applied to our nation for the last 200 years don't apply anymore. And so you got people, you know, who um, are, you know, basically who are, who are screaming about tyranny and they're tyrants themselves. And you, got, you, get, it, you know, our, our culture is just nuts and it's all moving towards this stuff. And it's pretty scary to me because this is the United States and this has all happened within my lifetime and a lot of this stuff has been taking place and I've been in shock at how quickly it's been happening, especially over the last oh, eight to 10 years or so. It's, it's pretty wild. And it's on, uh, it's on every level. It's on every level. And, you know, and it's like any Bible study that I'm doing, we were just doing uh, on Wednesday night, going through uh, Leviticus chapter 18, talking about sexual perversion. And, and it's like, I can, I can make predictions about where the culture is going to go as far as sexual perversion based on, on uh, Leviticus chapter 18. Because cultures that start going down certain roads end up in certain places. God, war you know, God uh, uh, condemned and, and judged the Canaanites. And when he did that, he told the Israelites, if you do the same thing, I'm going to condemn and judge you. And that's exactly what they did. They did exactly the same thing when their culture began to degrade. And so there's, you know, there's, a, bunch of, there's a bunch of markers in the Bible that speak about these things. And in any case... The point that I'm making is there's got to be a consolidation period uh, where the Antichrist basically um, gets his kingdom. Then he begins this whole thing with, I'm God, you have to worship me, bow the knee, do it now, or I'll kill you. And, you know, the Bible's clear on that. And then judgments start coming from heaven. And so we did the Revelation uh, chapter 6 judgments, the sealed judgments, and that's kind of an overview these get um, more and more specific in certain areas. And so we're in the trumpet judgments. And I believe the trumpet judgments most likely start taking place after this guy has done his stuff with the temple. And then you get judgments from God. Um, things that are obviously judgments, judgments from God. And so the first one that we saw, first trumpet, uh, sounds and hail and fire followed. We talked about this last week, mingled with blood. And they were thrown to the earth and a third of the trees were burned up and all the green grass was burned up. And I compared that with... Um, the book of Exodus and the fact that there was uh, the same kind of judgment that came down on the people of Egypt before um, Moses delivered them. That word for hail there and all the way through the book of Revelation, that word for hail, and this is something that, that you need to um, keep in mind, is a word that comes from Greek roots that mean to let down, to strike from a gaping opening. Um, Luonida 
uh, which is a, a Greek dictionary, or a Greek, uh, yeah, it's a Greek dic dictionary, basically a lexicon, um, said this, in a number of languages, hail is described as frozen rain, but it may be referred to by more idiomatic expressions such as cloud stones. It's the idea of stones falling from the, from the clouds. I just saw uh, an article the, uh, the other day about the, one of the largest hailstones that they've ever seen. And it's about eight inches across, and it weighed about eight ounces, about half a pound. And I'm, I'm giving you, you know, I, I, I can't remember the, the exact measurements. They always have that. But it's about eight, eight inches across, about half a pound. The Bible talks about 100-pound hailstones, 100-pound. And there's a, there's a good likelihood that it's not talking about ice. It's talking about something else. You know, um, ancients, when they would look at these things, um, would uh, talk about um, cloud stones or stones falling from the sky. And we, we know them as meteors and meteorites, that kind, of, that kind of thing. And so we did the first trumpet. The second trumpet, um, we got into a little bit. It says, verse 8, Then the second angel sounded, and something like a great mountain, mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea and a third of the sea became blood and a third of the living creatures in the sea died and a third of the ships were destroyed. And um, last week I was talking about uh, interpretation of the Bible. One of the things that you have with the book of Revelation is that it's been around for 2,000 years and uh, one, of the, one of the problems that we've had in the church um, from about the 200s on is allegorical interpretation of scripture. And I talked a little bit about this uh, this morning, but this is a this is a great place where um, this stuff can can be pointed out. Um, in the passage uh, for the first trumpet, when it talks about um, hail and fire followed, and a third of the trees were burned up, and all green grass was burned up, I just picked up one of my old commentaries. A lot of times I'm doing this from memory, but I picked up one of my old commentaries. You know what they said the trees were? Nobles, nobility, high high ups in government. And all the green grass, you know what that is? Green grass is just nothing but the rest of us. Now, you know, basically all, all, of, the, all of the citizenry of a, of a country. Does that say nobles and citizenry? No, what it says is trees and grass is what it says. And then when you get to the second trumpet here, something like a great mountain burning with fire. And, you know, what these guys will do will go, they try to find it in history, and they go, well, it can't be actually a great mountain burning with fire falling through the atmosphere. Um, what it must be is a government. And so maybe that's the fall of the Roman Empire. And because of the fall of the Roman Empire, you have the sea, and maybe that's the, the peoples of the earth, and a third of the sea became blood. And so maybe a third of the people on the earth uh, died when the Roman Empire fell apart, and a third of the living creatures in the sea died. Well, okay, <laughs> uh, if the sea turns to blood and that's people and the living creatures, maybe, maybe there's, a, there's, there's a parallel thing and a third of the ships were destroyed and most times they don't know what the ships are. Sometimes they'll say the ships are, are commerce and so a third of the commerce is destroyed, that kind of stuff. Does that say governments, people, or commerce? And what it says is something burn, burning like a mountain falls into the sea a third of the creatures in the sea um, are destroyed. A third of the sea turns to blood. And what it says is that a, th a third of the ships are destroyed. And so that's a that's the second trumpet. And so something like a mountain. And so last last week I talked about Rattlesnake Mountain. I, I said I was going to go Google it. So I got a I got a Google Earth program. And actually I take measurements of lots and stuff like that when I'm do any, anything that has to do with con, construction stuff and checking things out. So I just, I just you know, zeroed in on Rattlesnake Mountain. That thing's 22 miles long, 13 miles across is, is what that is. And um, that's a small mountain, basically. Um, I have uh, uh, um, actually some slides that are a condensation of an article uh, by a guy named Sid, Sid, excuse me, Sidney Vanderberg, the article was called Life and Death in the Inner Solar System, and it was published in the May 1989 issue of the publications of the Astronomical Society of the Pacific. What I'm telling you is this guy is not a Christian. He's an, he's an astronomer, and he's talking about what the impacts, pun intended, of, of a, an asteroid collision would be with the Earth. And what he does is he uh, considers a typical impact scenario of a 10-kilometer object 
with a density, uh, density of about 2.5 times that of water, impacting at a speed of 20 kilometers per second. Um, a kilometer is about uh, 6.62 of a mile, about five-eighths of a mile. And so when you're talking about a 10-kilometer um, asteroid hitting the Earth, you're talking about something that's about six miles across. Okay, and so he does all the numbers of this. Um, when you look at what happens with that, you know, first of, first of all, obviously there's an explosion. And so I'm just going to go, kind of go through the article and give you some highlights of this. And this is up on the, on the screen. So you have an explosion first. And he said in the article, the largest yield of a thermonuclear warhead is around 50 to 100 megatons. That's the, that's the, 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 the most massive nuclear weapon that was ever fired off was by the Russians, and it was called the Tsar Bomba, Bomba and it was 100 megatons. Um, the most massive one that we did, I, gosh, I think it might have been 50, but I think it's about 30 uh, megatons, but I can't remember. Kinetic energy of the falling object, something again that is about six miles across, kinetic en energy of the falling object is converted to, uh, to an explosion when it hits. The 10-kilometer object produces an explosion of six times 10 to the seventh megatons of t TNT. So when you're talking about six times 10 to the seventh, you're, you're talking about six times one with seven zeros behind it, okay? It's 10 million. So you get, you're talking about 60 million megatons, 60 million megatons of TNT, equivalent to uh, an uh, earthquake of magnitude 12.4 on the Richter scale. I don't know where they got that because the Richter scale only goes up to 10. And so they, you know, they must be extrapolating beyond it. In any case, um, it goes on and says this, on its way to, to the impact, the asteroid pushes aside the air in front of it, creating a hole in the atmosphere. The atmosphere above the impact site is removed for several tens of seconds. In other words, there's, there's a vacuum behind the asteroid. Um, before the surrounding air can rush back in to fill the gap, material from the impact, vaporized asteroid, crustal material, and ocean water, if it lands in the ocean, escapes through the hole, follows a ballistic flight back down. Within two minutes after impact, about 105, uh, uh, excuse me, 10 to the fifth cubic kilometers of ejecta. And again, a kilometer is about five-eighths of a mile and you're talking about 10 to the fifth, so that's one with five zeros behind it, cubic kilometers. So an, uh, five eighths of a mile, 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 you know, that, that, that whole thing um, times 10 to the fifth. Cubic kilometers of ejecta, that's 10 to the 13th tons, and that's one with 13 zeros behind it, is lofted to about 100 kilometers. That's into space, okay? Um, if the asteroid hits the ocean, the surrounding water returning over the hot crater floor is vaporized. A large enough impact will break through to the hot lithosphere and maybe the even hotter asthenosphere, um, sending more water vapor into the air as well as causing huge steam explosions that greatly compound the effect of the initial impact explosion. There's going to be a crater regardless of where it lands. The diameter, diameter of the crater in kilometers uh, it, well, you don't care about this, but um, it's, it's based on a, on a formula. Plugging in the typical impact values, you get a 150-kilometer diameter crater, 93 miles for a 10-kilometer asteroid. Whether you're talking about on the land or whether you're talking about in the ocean, it does not matter. So you've got a 93-mile crater. And this isn't a big, it's not a big asteroid. Um, the tsunami that comes from it, a 10-kilometer asteroid hitting any deep point in the Pacific, uh, the largest ocean, produces a mega tsunami along the entire Pacific Rim. And so then there's a chart up there that gives you the distance um, from the impact and what's going, uh, the height of the wave that comes in. And so if you are 186 miles from the impact, the wave on a 10-kilometer asteroid is 4,265 feet tall. It's almost a mile. Just, you know, it's about uh, um, four-fifths of a mile. If it was a one-kilometer asteroid in the Pacific Ocean, 
the wave, uh, when, uh, the wave from that impact, if you're 186 miles away, is 138 feet for one kilometer. That's just five-eighths of a mile. Um, if you are um, 621 miles, this was, this was done in kilometers, and so I converted it. Um, if you were uh, 621 miles away, the wave uh, from a 10-kilometer asteroid would be 1,772 feet. If you are 1,864 miles away, 820 feet. And you can see, you know, obviously, if you're further away, if you're 6,213 miles away, 328 feet. So, so over 6,000 miles away, it's still 328 feet tall. So anything on the, coast, on the coastlines is going to get wiped out. So you have something the size of a mountain hitting the ocean anywhere on this planet, and you're going to have a mega tsunami. Not only are you going to have one mega tsunami, but what happens is the waves go out and they come back and pile up, and then you're going to, you're going to have a crustal slipping underneath, and most of the tsunamis we have come from that. So you're going to have multiple tsunamis. So you're going to have one large one from the impact, and then you're going to have other tsunamis that come from the effects afterwards. Not only are you going to have this inundation of water that comes along the coastlines, you're going to have a global firestorm. And this is why I put it at, at this point in the study, because we've already had the global firestorm. And if you are anywhere inland from an asteroid impact, that's the first thing that you're going to see. You're going to get the firestorm before you ever know about the impact in the ocean. Because again, what happens with the ejecta, the stuff that comes out of that crater is it goes up into space and it doesn't have orbital velocity and so it comes down on a, what's called a ballistic trajectory. That's what happens when we fire missiles over to Russia or Russia fires missiles over to us. It's a ballistic trajectory. It comes back down into the atmosphere and it rains down as stones from heaven. That's what will be happening. And so the article goes on and says this. And again, this guy, does, you know, I don't know that this guy knows anything about the Bible. Okay, as, as far as what the Bible has to say about this. It says, the material ejected from the impact through the hole in the atmosphere will re-enter all, all over the globe and heat up from the friction with the atmosphere. The chunks of material will be hot enough to produce a lot of infrared light. That's heat. Uh, the heat from the glowing material will start fires around the globe. Global fires uh, will put about 7 times 10 to the 10th tons of soot into the air. Um, this would aggravate environmental stresses associated with the impact. And again, not only will you have that taking place um, from a global fire, firestorm, but you're going to have water that's thrown into the atmosphere too. And so one of the things that people are worried about right now is global warming with a couple of percentage points increase in, in uh, carbon dioxide. We're going to get global warming. And the Bible talks about it on levels that, that you know, we, we have never experienced, and it has to do with some of the judgments that, that come down in this, this whole thing. Then you get acid rain. And so I'm not going to do all the, the chemistry with you, but basically, the, uh, again, acid rain, the heat from the shock wave of the entering asteroid and reprocessing of the air close to the impact produces nitric and nitrous acids over the next few months to one, to one year. And anybody who's involved in chemistry knows that these are really bad acids. In fact, these, these are chemicals that are used in rocket fuel. Okay? Um, they're, uh, again, in the article, he says, these are really nasty acids. They will wash out of the air when it rains. A worldwide deluge of acid rain with damaging effects. Destruction of, or damage of foliage. Greater amounts of weathering of continental rocks. The upper, upper ocean organisms are killed. These organisms are responsible for locking up carbon dioxide in their shells that would eventually become limestone. However, the shells will dissolve in the acid water. That, along with the impact winter, kills off about 90% of all marine nanoplankton species. A majority of the free oxygen from photosynthesis on the Earth is made by nanoplankton. The ozone layer is destroyed by ozone reacting uh, with uh, nitrogen monoxide. The uh, amount of ultraviolet light hitting the surface increases, killing small organisms and plants, uh, key parts of the food chain. The nitrogen dioxide causes respiratory damage in larger um, animals. And so you not only have the, the problems that come from the impact, but you also have problems that come from the nitric acids. 
Um, here's another, this isn't in the article, this is just some other stuff that I looked up. Nitric acid um, is, uh, uh, what do I want to do here? Uh, nitric acid, uh, you don't want the chemical process, comes, comes from a reaction with um, nitrogen and oxygen, that kind of stuff. There, uh, and I'll just give you the, the basics of it. The reaction may give rise to some non-negligible variations of the vapor pressure above the liquid. You don't want that either. Um, this, is, this is what I want to do with this. Um, the really concentrated forms of nitric acid, you have, you have a number of different colors that come with nitric acid. And so some of the colors uh, that you have can be white. There, there can be white foam fumes when it's exposed to the air. Um, if you have it dissolved with nitrogen dioxide, um, it ends up giving off what are, uh, what are reddish brown vapors, leading to the common name red fuming acid or fuming nitric acid. Um, red fuming nitric acid contains substantial quantities of dissolved nitrogen dioxide, leaving the solution with a reddish brown color. What I'm telling you is that it's going to rain blood. That's what it's going to look like. And that's just out of the chemical reaction that takes place. And so, again, what we have here is a 2,000-year-old book with a dude who's off on an island by himself someplace. Jesus is telling him what's going to be taking place in the future. And what, what you have written down in this thing matches precisely an article that's put together by an astronomer who most likely is not a believer and most likely has never even considered Revelation chapter 8 to be something that you would even look at as something that would be factual. And yet what happens is when, when we read the things that he's talking about, you see those, uh, you see everything that he talks about with just uh, uh, an asteroid that uh, is, again, um, six miles across hit in the ocean. And it's exactly what the Bible describes here. And so you would have fire mingled with blood coming down to the earth. The trees would be burned up. The green grass would be burned up. You would have an impact in the ocean if it, you know, when it hits the ocean. You would have the sea becoming blood because when you're talking about uh, red tides, those kinds of things, you heard of red tides. Um, well, one of the, the major players in the whole chemical process in red tides is, guess what? Nitrogen. And so you're going to have plenty of nitrogen because of nitric, nitric acid and that kind of stuff in the water. Um, a red tide occurs. This is from the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. A red tide occurs when either natural or human factors cause a rapid increase of the production of one-celled organisms, which ordinarily grow in water rich in nitrogen and phosphorus. These destructive red ties often resulting in what is known as paralytic shellfish poisoning have occurred since biblical times, but are becoming much more prevalent today. And most times it's with sewage and, and that kind of stuff. And you can go on and read the rest of that if you want to. Um, uh, it's kind of interesting. So um, you have red coming from the nitric acids that are, that are falling down. You have red that's going to come from the pollution of the water. Uh, because of red tides. Um, there's a couple of pictures. Go ahead and do the, the pictures, Levi. Um, so th these are a couple of pictures of actual red tides. So this is an, an area in Texas. Do the next one. That's another example of what a red tide looks like. What's that look like to you? Yeah, it looks like blood. And so, you know, when I, when I go through and look at these things, uh, you know, when it, when it says the sea became blood, can God turn the sea into blood? Yes, absolutely, and he can do that. And so I don't know if it's talking about the sea looks like blood or if the sea actually becomes blood. Uh, you know that, actually, you know that when uh, guys are looking at the ocean, um, the ocean itself really closely mimics human blood. Do you know that? Chemical composition of the ocean. All it needs is more iron. And so, you know, you've, you've got that, that kind of stuff going on too. The point that I'm making here is that this stuff can literally happen. Uh, uh, a mountain falling into the ocean is going to have certain effects, and they are exactly the effects that are described here in the book of Revelation. Let's go to the third trumpet. It says, uh, oh, you know what? I don't, have that, uh, I don't have it that way in my notes. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to mess up Levi if we do. Uh, let, let me do this with you. Um, when this happens, 
This isn't the only judgment on the ocean. Uh, there are more judgments on the ocean that come later on. So turn over to Revelation chapter 16. Revelation 16, 3. Actually, you don't even need to turn because it's going to be up on the screen. Revelation 16, 3, it says, Then the second angel poured out his bowl on the sea, and it became blood as of a dead man, and every living creature in the sea died. So when you're in Revelation chapter 8, it says a third of the, of the creatures in the sea die. When you get to Revelation chapter 16, and the bold judgments, it says everything in the sea dies. And what that's called is a cascading event. And so you, ha you have a situation where, where something happens in the ocean where a third of the sea dies. And then later on, not only does that die, but it, it continues, that event continues and ends up killing all life in the ocean. And again, when you're, when you're talking about some of the effects of this, he was talking about the, uh, the problem with protoplankton and, and, and that kind of stuff. That is a cascading event. Once you start poisoning the ocean, oceans, and specifically if it's with nitric acid and on a large scale acid rain, that kind of stuff, you are, you are going to start wiping out the food chain in the ocean, and you're going to end up with everything dead. That's what the Bible says is going to happen. And then in Revelation 16, 4, it says, And the, the third angel poured out his bowl on the rivers and springs of water, and they became blood. And so not only do we have this effect taking place in the ocean, we have this, this effect taking place in the, in the fresh water. In just a minute, we're going to go back and look at wormwood and, and see what's um, happening with that in the third trumpet judgment. And then in Revelation 16, 8, it says, And the fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, and power was given to him to scorch men with fire. And I already read to you what, what takes place when you have something that large going through the atmosphere. It wipes out the ozone layer. It wipes it out. It doesn't exist anymore. And so now you have ultraviolet light coming into the atmosphere without the protection that we get from the ozone layer, and that's what will happen. It will burn people. Um, there's going to be an immediate effect that takes place where uh, the sun and the moon and the stars are going to be blotted out, because of smoke and soot and, and uh, all the junk that's in the atmosphere from the explosion. But then after that um, starts raining out, then you're going to have no ozone layer and the sun's going to be burning people. And so again, war global warming is in the Bible, but it's not, you know, uh, it's not anthropogenic global warming. It's theogenic, caused by God, <laughs> global warming. Um, Revelation 16.10 says, Then the fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast, and his kingdom became full of darkness, and they gnawed their tongues because of the pain. And so you have this combination of darkness and the sun burning you and all of these things that are going on, and those are, after, those are easily after effects of a scenario, of the kind of scenario that I just gave you. And so the point that I'm making here is what the Bible says is stuff that we're worried about. And we've only been worried about this since I've been a kid. So back in 1975, that's when they first started coming out with disaster movies that had the, the whole idea of something large hitting the earth. The first one was with Sean Connery that I remember, and it was called Meteor. And then it goes on, and you, you have these other ones that came out in the 80s and then in the 90s. You have Bruce Willis saving the world from from a cometary impact, and then you have deep impact, and all these cool, you know, there's some, there's some cool uh, CGI effects, you know, with, with uh, uh, New York getting wiped out and all this stuff. Those, those things are cool, and they're actually, they did a good job on deep impact as far as the, the tsunami that comes and that kind of stuff. They don't talk about the after tsunamis that will be coming, but, you know, they did, get a, they did get, do a good job on that one. That's just, uh, if you remember that movie, Deep Impact, remember the, you know, where the son and the daughter, or the, the daughter and the father are standing on the beach and the waves coming, and she goes, Daddy, you know, and wham, it wipes them out. That's only a 1,400, they, they pictured that as a 1,400 uh, foot tall mega tsunami, 1,400 foot. It can be up to 4,000 feet. And so you, you take that and triple it. And that's what you're talking about depending on the distance that you are from this thing. And so um, if you have it um, hitting, for example, the Atlantic Ocean, the Atlantic Ocean is about a third of the volume of the water that's on the Earth. And so it may be, uh, you know, an impact on the Atlantic that would wipe out everything on the coast of the Atlantic, whether you're talking about North America or South America, would wipe out everything on the coast, and um, obviously a third of shipping. So again, you have that whole thing. So what I'm telling you 
is that when you're looking at the first trumpets, the, first, the, the trumpet judgments, those look like some of the first ones that are happening at the beginning of the last half of the tribulation period, what Jesus calls the great tribulation. And it looks like the, the bold judgments are after effects. Not that they're not more judgments, but they're after effects. It looks like it's a cascade effect that come from the first one itself. And so it's not like you just get the first one and that's all there is to it. There's a first one and then everything that comes from that. Um, let's go back to Revelation 8 if you, if you turn. It says, in the third trumpet, then the third angel sounded and a great star fell from heaven burning like a torch and it fell on a third of the rivers and on the springs of water. And the name of the star is Wormwood. A third of the waters became Wormwood and many men died from the water because it was made bitter. And so you don't have just one impact. You have more than one. And so you have the impact of something the size of a mountain hitting the ocean, but then you have another one that comes down and it falls from heaven and it's burning like a torch and it falls on a third of the waters. What that's called is a bolide. And so you have something that's smaller or something that's less compact. Um, if uh, a lot of the asteroids that we see in um, our solar system, some of them are very dense and uh, they're made up of iron and nickel and that kind of thing. They, they've even found asteroids that most likely have gold and some precious metals in it. That's been in the news lately. And so you have some of them that are very dense, but others of them are loosely consolidated. It's, it, it's kind of like, uh, I don't know, loose dirt clods. When I was a kid, we used to play army and we would get dirt clods and we th would throw them at each other. And you wanted to make sure that the dirt clod wasn't something that was so hard that it would really hurt somebody. It'd be, it's kind of cool when, it, when, you, when you can throw it and it stays together and then it goes poof. Well, that's, a, that's the kind of picture that you have here. You have things that are loosely consolidated. It hits the atmosphere and it goes poof and it blows up and blows apart in the atmosphere and then it spreads out. And because of that, again, it talks about a uh, pollution of the third of the waters. That same stuff that I was talking about with the first asteroid impact is the same kind of situation you're gonna have with the second one. You're still going to have a situation where uh, the ozone layer is being affected, the nitrogen in the atmosphere, you know that our atmosphere is mostly nitrogen, right? And the nitrogen is at, in the atmosphere is gonna be affected and you're gonna have the same kind of effect that takes place with nitric acids and nitrous ac acids and, and that kind of stuff coming down. And so you're going to have a poisoning of fresh water. And then again, later on, it's not just a third of the water, it's all of the water. So again, a cascading event. And then finally in verse, uh, 12, it says, then the fourth angel sounded. I mean, let, me, let me make sure I hit everything on that whole thing. Oh, check this out. Go ahead and, um, Levi, I, I missed that. Put up that slide with a, this is a monument of the third angel. That's a Chernobyl. You guys remember Ch Chernobyl? Some of you are too young. Uh, in, uh, Chernobyl was a nuclear reactor that got away from the Russians and uh, basically it melted down and um, it caused a major nuclear uh, incident and spread nuclear material all over uh, Western, Eastern and Western Europe. And so it was a big deal back in the 80s. And when the whole thing with Chernobyl came out, one of the, one of the things that's interesting about the, the name Chernobyl itself is that it, um, uh, when you translate it from Ukrainian into English, guys were saying that the name Chernobyl itself meant wormwood. And so they were saying, maybe this is a fulfillment of Revelation chapter eight with, a, with, a, with wormwood. And so you got an artist who came out and in that area, in the town that's uh, of Chernobyl, he came and he built this, uh, uh, this monument to Chernobyl and it's called the monument of the third angel. And he's talking about the third angel uh, that blows the third trumpet in the book of Revelation. Actually, the, the term uh, that was used, actually the, the name Chernobyl doesn't actually mean wormwood, it means mugwort. And um, it's related to uh, what we would call wormwood, but it's not quite the same. In any case, you have that. And so again, you have some kind of chemical substance that ends up polluting uh, the waters and it looks like they name it before it ever even gets here. Maybe after, they, after it gets here, but it looks like they name it before it gets here. And that's a possibility, excuse me, that's a possibility because 
um, when the sun reflects off certain things, you can do what's called spectrograph spectrography, and you can get the um, uh, you can figure out what the elements in the light um, are made of. And so we know what the sun's made of because of the spectrum that comes off it. We know what certain stars are made of because of the spectrum that comes off of those stars. Um, they're looking at, at, uh, at looking at planets in other solar systems now and looking at the light that comes off those planets. If they can block out the light from their stars, they can look at the light that comes from their, off their atmospheres. And you can look for things like nitrogen and oxygen and even water. And so you'll, you'll read about this stuff. Uh, in uh, science magazines and, and that kind of thing. And so either before the star falls, um, they, they do a chemical analysis on it, or it's after the star, falls, uh, the star falls and they call it wormwood. And so again, that's a bull light, and it comes down and hits everything. Verse 12, uh, it goes on and says, Then the fourth angel sounded, and a third of the sun was struck. This is the fourth trumpet. A third of the sun was struck, a third of the moon and a third of the stars, so that a third of them were darkened. A third of the day did not shine, and likewise the night. And so you have darkness on the earth. There's a passage in Amos chapter 8, uh, verses 2 and 3, and then verse 9. It says, And he said, Amos, what do you see? So I said, A basket of summer fruit. Then the Lord said to me, The end has come upon my people Israel. I will not pass by them any more. And the songs of the temple shall be wailing in that day, says the Lord God. Many dead bodies everywhere, they shall be thrown out in silence. And it shall come to pass in that day, says the Lord God, that I will make the sun go down at noon, and I will darken the earth in broad daylight. And so you have a number of references in the Old Testament to the end times, and that the, fa the fact that, the, that on the one hand, there's going to be a period of time when the sun is diminished, then on the other hand, you're going to have a period of time when the sun is strengthened. And so both of those things are taking place. You have it in the book of Revelation in uh, chapter 8. You have the sun being diminished. When you get to chapter 16, you have the sun burning men on the earth. And so there's a diminishment, and then there's an intensity to the whole thing. And again, you can, you can explain that with some of the things that are going on in these passages. And these are passages that speak about the fact that God is judging the earth, literally trumpet blows, angel blows the trumpet, this thing happens. It's, it's that kind of picture. So when it says a third of the, of the, a third of the sun was struck, a third of the moon, a third of the stars, that could be a, a situation where you have darkness. And obviously that would be something that, that came from this situation because again, you'd have a lot of soot in the atmosphere. Um, I don't know, you know, there's a, there's a possibility that the rotation of the earth could be changed. And so if you have, have a, a glancing blow, in other words, it's, it's coming in on a large angle and it hits the earth in, uh, in the right direction, you can have a speed up of the rotation of the earth. That's a possibility. That's not as likely as, as just, a, just a cloud. You have a, what I'm saying is if you speed up the rotation of the earth, then the sun is not in the sky as long as it is. And so the reason it's up for you know, uh, an average of 12 hours is because the Earth is turning at about 1,000 miles an hour at the equator. And so if you speed that up by a, by a third, basically, then what you're going to get is a situation where the sun is only up for eight hours. And it's only night for eight hours. So you go from a 24-hour day to a 16-hour day and uh, that kind of thing. But I think that most likely what we're talking about is uh, um, a situation where um, you have uh, smoke and, and soot in the atmosphere. Okay, so one of the, one of the points that I was making before is that um, this whole idea of an asteroid impact is like relatively, I shouldn't even say relatively, it's new. It's brand new as far as science goes, as far as Earth history goes. Um, you, um, if you, if you, you know, if you're in your 20s or 30s, um, you grew up knowing about asteroid impacts, knowing about the, the dangers that we have from things flying through the solar system, and even uh, you might be worried about those things. And so it's a, it's a great thing that NASA has uh, uh, telescopes trained on the heavens looking for near-Earth asteroids, that kind of thing. And when they, when they come by, you always see them in, uh, in the news. And so 
Um, when, you, when you look at the speeds that these, these things are flying by and you look at the size of them, you're going to get situations like what we just talked about if it ever hits the earth. Um, and so the point that I'm making is I'm used to this because it's been going on since about 1975 or so. Um, scientists more and more have been talking about this. Back in the early 80s, um, you guys know about the asteroid impact and the death of the dinosaurs, right? You guys know about this? 65 million years ago, Earth was impacted by a comet or an asteroid, and that was the end of the dinosaurs. And that's, that's you know, and they, they talk about off the Yucatan uh, Peninsula and that kind of thing. When that first came out, when that theory first came out, nobody believed it. Nobody was going for it. Nobody in paleontology, nobody in astronomy, nobody was going for it. And the guys who came up with that theory had to push and push and push to, uh, to be validated by that. They were questioned left and right. It was something where they got lots of ridicule when they came out with this theory because up until that point, up until the 80s, and, and specifically uh, that theory about the destruction of the dinosaurs, up until that point, all of evolution was based on the fact that everything that you see on the planet um, got here through slow processes that we see at work right now around us and they didn't want any catastrophes. They, would, they, they, wouldn't, they wouldn't allow uh, catastrophic events taking place in the far past or even in the near past. And so you guys, you guys grew up in Washington State. You know about the Missoula floods, right? You guys know about those? And so that, that whole thing with the Missoula floods, it was after the last ice age. There was an ice dam. The ice dam broke up around Missoula. There was a lake up there. Uh, the theory goes, and the ice dam broke, and all this water came down and you know carved out the scab lands that you have further on further on up the potholes, all those lakes uh, were carved out by that whole thing came down through uh, the area of the Columbia basin car carved out the Wallula gap and and all of that stuff and when that theory came out, that was in the sixties again, absolute ridicule on that guy because they didn 't want any of that going on, and those two actually those two. Uh, theories about um, ancient history were two of the kind of groundbreaking theories that got people to start considering uh, catastrophic processes uh, taking place on the earth. And it's just evident. You're sitting on a mile of lava where we're at. It's a mile of lava. And so when you, when you go down through the Columbia uh, Gorge, you see on the side the, you know, the pillars of rock that are there on either side of the gorge. That's basalt, it's lava. And that's not lava that came from a volcano. It didn't come from the Cascades. It came from a couple of places um, around this area where the earth literally cracked open and the lava from underneath bubbled up and flowed over Oregon, Idaho, and Washington, all the way up to Spokane, all the way down to the middle of Oregon, almost all the way to the Cascades, some, in some places to the Cascades, all the way back into Idaho. It was huge. And so obviously, there's nothing like that going on now. You know, there's no place on the planet where you can find 100,000 square miles of mile-deep lava. And, and so obviously, big things have happened on the Earth before, and these are things that people are considering now. So they're considering asteroid impacts as having uh, caused problems in the past, and so they're now looking for them in the future. The point that I'm making here is... Number one, these are judgments that come from God. Angel blows a trumpet, these things happen. These are judgments that come from God. But we are being prepared for them to be the natural consequence of the neighborhood that we live in. We got a bunch of asteroids that are out beyond Mars orbit in between Mars and, and Jupiter. And we have asteroids that, that uh, get knocked out of that orbit and come inside and follow the Earth or cross the Earth's orbit, go inside the orbit of Venus and and that kind of thing, and those are called near-Earth asteroids. And so we're, we're getting um, basically spoken to about these things, and this is all new. It's all brand new. And we're, we're spoken to over and over about the danger of these things, and I really believe that um, Satan is an influence. And I'm not talking of the, you know, I'm not saying that scientists that say these things are satanic. I'm saying that Satan's smart, and Satan has to have, have an answer for things that he knows is go, are going to take place. God is going to do this. And he's got to be able to take 
a population of people on this planet who are undergoing these kinds of judgments, and he's got to be able to dismiss them as being judgments from God. And so I come from that kind of background in the sense that I like science and I like all this stuff. And so if I wasn't a believer and I wasn't reading this stuff, um, I might, you know, if those things happen to me, I, I might just go, well, you know what? It was going to happen sooner or later, and unfortunately I'm in the generation where it happened. And I think that that's where a lot of people are going to end up. Um, but God makes it clear that he's the one who's causing these things. He's the one that's doing this stuff. And these are things that um, people um, obviously need to understand. Um, I, I think that living during the tribulation period, um, I would be having a, you know, I might be having a problem talking to people about this stuff. Did you know this is a judgment from God? And if I didn't have the, the information that I've got where, you know, I can, I can come out, you know, I can pull out the information and say, this is what it says in the, in the passage in the Bible. This, was, this is what was predicted by astronomers. This is exactly what's taken place. Here it is, dude, black and white, written down 2,000 years ago. And you'd be having those kinds of arguments with a guy like me. Because, again, I'd, be, I'd just be going, hey, it had to happen sooner or later. It happened to the dinosaurs, and here we are now. And we should have been more prepared taking care of these asteroids, blown up with nukes, painting them black, you know, that kind of thing, so that you can change the whatever. You can change the orbit of an atmosphere or of an asteroid by painting it, basically. In any case, um, you have this stuff going on. So how's this apply to us? Because you know what? If you're a Christian, you're not going to be here. You're going to be, you're going to, you're going to be having a sky-eye view of this whole thing. And so that picture that was up there with the explosion, that's going to be the viewpoint that you have of this. You know, we're always already going to be with the Lord. Check this out. Turn over to Leviticus. We'll, we'll end it, or not Leviticus, um, Luke. They both start with L, right? <laughs> Luke chapter 21. In Luke chapter 21, this will, this will give a, a, a new um, point of view for you for some verses that we're going to talk about. Okay, I'm, I'm just going to really quick go through and, and, and show you kind of an overview of what's being spoken about. Um, these guys, the disciples, are talking about the stones in the temple, verse 5. The uh, temple was adorned with beautiful stones. And Jesus says in verse 6 that there's not going to be one of them that's not thrown down. And in verse 7, they say, Teacher, when will these things be, and what will the sign be when these things are about to take place? And then he starts doing what he did in Matthew chapter 24. In fact, this is the same sermon. And you're just getting snippets from this passage of the Matthew 24 sermon. There are some things in here that aren't in the Matthew 24 sermon. And so he talks about the destruction of Jerusalem in this passage in verses 20 through 24. But he starts it off the same way. Verse 8, take heed that, you're, take heed that you not be deceived, for many will come in my name, saying, I am he, the time is drawn near, therefore do not go after them. But when you hear of wars and commotions, don't be terrified, for these things must come to pass, but the end will not come immediately. Nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. Verse 11, there will be great earthquakes in various places and famines, and there will be fearful sights and great signs from heaven. Verse 12, but before all these things, they will lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogue and prisons. You will be brought before kings and rulers for my namesake. And so he goes through, and basically he's going through the tribulation period, and he's giving you the high points. And they, again, match with Revelation chapter 6. And we already talked about that. He stops in verse 20. Um, in verse 19, he says, By your patience, possess your souls. And then in verse 20, he talks about the destruction of Jerusalem. He says, When you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know that its desolation is near. Um, then you need to be, you know, you need to get out of Dodge is basically what he says, which is what the Christian church did. Then he goes on in verse 25. Look at verse 25. There will be signs in the sun, in the moon, and in the stars, and, the and on the earth distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring. And so when I first read that, when I first read the New Testament, I get to this passage, and it's a pretty gnarly passage, the sea and the waves roaring. Well, I'm a guy who's um, spent time around the ocean. I used to go down you know, to uh, the beach in Southern California just about every weekend in the summer. And a lot of times I go down in the, in the winter and, 
and uh, just spend some time down there. And, and I've been around the ocean when the sea and the waves are roaring. And so there are times when the waves are high enough, 20, you know, 25 feet, and they're coming over the tops of the piers that are out there. And so you, you see this stuff. And so it's a pretty radical thing when the, when the waves break and they're that big, loud noises, right? Um, and so that's what I'm thinking, the sea and the waves roaring. And, but, you know, when you're talking about what's spoken about in Revelation chapter 8, that, you know, <laughs> that's the sea and the waves roaring in ways that I never, ever experienced. It's going to be a horrendous thing. And so if you're even talking about a minimal impact, one kilometer across, you're talking about hundreds of feet of wave coming down on a coastline. And so seeing the waves roaring take on a, a whole different aspect when you look at this. It says men's hearts failing them from fear and the expectation of those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of the heavens will be shaken. And again, you know, picture yourself, and, and, and again, you know, there's a, there's a couple of movies that did a really good job on this. Deep Impact was uh, one of those movies. It starts off with a reporter who's uh, chasing down a guy who's in the, in the government, he's in a cabinet position, and all of a sudden he, uh, he resigns his position and is getting out of town. And because she has a mistake, she, she hears about, you know, there's a name that's connected with this whole thing and connected with him, and it's the name that they've given the impactor. It's Ellie. And so she thinks that it's a scandal, so she's going after this guy for scandal, and all he's trying to do is get out of Dodge with his children because he knows what's coming on the coastline. He knows that the, that the whole coast of the United States is going to be wiped out. He's afraid. And they did a really good job of showing this guy and showing him being afraid. And that's the same kind of picture that you have here. These things are not going to happen without warning. And so you have something coming in. You know, we already have telescopes looking at these things. And you're going to have astronomers that come up and say, we can see it coming. And this is most likely what's going to happen. And men's hearts will be failing them. They're going to be in situations where maybe they can't get out or they don't know if they can get far enough away and they're going to be frightened to death. You have to think about this stuff. If something that big ha um, hit, the, hit the Pacific Ocean, I don't know that it would get to us, but we're only at 400 feet. And so it could come up the Columbia Gorge. It would probably disperse. But if you're talking about something that's 4,000 feet coming up the Columbia Gorge, that's pretty intense. Might be spilling over the top of the Horse Heaven Hills, you know, at that point. And so men's hearts failing them. Pretty scary stuff. And again, for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. And look at verse 28. Now when these things begin to happen, and he's not talking about the things that are happening in the heavens, he's talking about everything that he just talked about. So you have to go back over to verse 8. Take heed that you're not deceived. There's going to be false Christ. There's going to be wars and rumors of wars. There's going to be these things going on around you. You're going to see these things begin to take place. And when you see these things begin to take place, he says, look up and lift up your heads because your redemption draws near. And with them, he says, after all these things, they will see the Son of Man coming. After all those things. But with you, when you see these things beginning to take place, you need to look up for your redemption is drawing near. And that's been the basis of um, every prophecy update that I've ever done. The reason I do prophecy updates is because Jesus made a promise that when you see these things begin to take place, you need to start paying attention, you need to start looking up because the Lord's about to come for you. The rest of them are going to have to go through it. But for you, he's about to come for you. And look down in verse 34. He says, but take heed to yourselves, lest your hearts be weighed down uh, with carousing drunkenness and cares of this life, and that day come on you unexpectedly. For it will come as a snare on all those who dwell on the face of the whole earth. Watch, therefore, and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. And so a lot of times when a commentator goes through here and he says, you know, you don't want that day to come on you unexpectedly. Well, what day is he talking about? 
And if the day that he's talking about is the second coming of Christ, well, we know when that happens. It happens at the end of the tribulation. After something burning like a, like a, like a mountain burning with fire hits the ocean. After something burning like a torch blows up in the atmosphere and pollutes a third of the waters. After a number of other judgments that we're going to talk about when we go through the book of Revelation happen, then... After all of that stuff, the stars of heaven fall to the earth, the, the, uh, the mountains melt, the islands disappear. Those kinds of things take place. Then Jesus comes. There's not going to be anybody who's not expecting Jesus to come at the second coming. Not anybody. In fact, the demons are expecting him. Uh, the armies of the world are expecting him. Everybody's expecting him. So he's talking about an unexpected event here. And that unexpected event has to, has to do with Jesus coming to get you. So when you see these things beginning to, ta beginning to happen, as he says in this passage, you look up and lift up your heads because your redemption draws near at that point. And then the rest of it happens and um, the, the judgment comes on them. So he specifically says, you know, you're in the end times. You're seeing, you're seeing the precursors of, that, of this stuff. And again, every prophecy update I've ever done is all about precursors. It's not about the events that are actually taking place. None of these things that are in the book of Revelation have happened yet. I've had kids, you know, down through the whole time that I've been in ministry. Um, I had high school, you know, I was a high school leader and, and that kind of stuff. I had kids come up to me all the time when there was a red tide down in Haiti or something. Is that you know, what the Bible says? No, that's not what the Bible says. It's a third of the ocean turns to blood. And then all of it, you know, dies. That's what the Bible says. So that's just the coastline of Haiti. We're, we're talking about something that's massive. It's on a massive scale. And so they'll say that kind of stuff. And none of, like I said, none of this has happened. But we're on, we're on the verge of those things taking place. And again, I think that Satan is preparing people uh, for these things. With us, he says, take heed to yourselves. Again, verse 20, 34 lest your hearts be weighed down with carousing, drunkenness, and cares of this life, and that day come on you unexpectedly. So there's a day coming that nobody expects, and we can miss it if we get caught up in the world. He specifically says, your hearts are weighed down with carousing and drunkenness. One of the things that's going to be happening in the last days, obviously, from what Jesus says here, is that people are going to be carousing and they're going to be getting drunk, and they're believers. That happening... And Jesus says, you don't want your hearts weighed down with those things, and it comes on unexpectedly, because it's going to come as a snare on all those who dwell on the face of the whole earth. And so you need to watch. And he says, watch and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things, and that will come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. That's what I'm praying for. I want to escape all these things and stand before the Son of Man. Actually, you know what? I've told you this before. I'm not really afraid of all these things because if I get wiped out by a mega tsunami, I go to heaven. <laughs> you know, so I'm not worried about it. I might go out and try to surf it or something. I don't know. You know, I, th I think that would be kind of pointless. You slam into a building or something. You know, but you, you, might, you might, you know, there's nothing that you can do about that stuff. And, you know, things are falling from the sky and, you know, something hits you and, and, and that kind of thing. Ah, you just, you know, you go to heaven. I, I like disaster stuff. I, I think that we need a reset on this planet. <laughs> and so disa disaster stuff in the United States, I, th I think that, you know, I think we have way, way too much time on our hands. And if we had to struggle for food and shelter, it might do us a whole lot of good. There's a whole lot of people on this planet that that's what they're doing, struggling for food and shelter, and they're godly and moral. And um, even when they don't know the Lord, they have a standard of morality that we don't see in the United States. There's not a decadence there because they're just busy trying to survive. And I think, you know, that, that would do the world a, a whole lot of good. I don't want something like Mad Max, but, you know, you, you have those things. I've, I've never been afraid of this stuff. Never been afraid of it. But I do believe that, uh, that Jesus specifically says that the church doesn't go through these things. And so I'm not worried about it because I don't want to go through the tribulation. I kind of think it would be cool. You know, going up to your friends and going, you know, you saw that thing happen? Guess what's next? You know, and going through and talking to them about it. I think that that would be cool. I think uh, that evangelism that during that time would be highly fruitful. You know, lots of people getting saved, like it says in Revelation 7. 
But with us, what we need to be doing is we need to be looking up again because our redemption is getting near. Jesus is coming for us. And that means that some people are going to be left. And I'm not interested in my family members being left. I'm not interested in going to heaven without my children. I'm not interested in going, in, going to heaven without my friends. Uh, I'm, I'm certainly not interested in going to heaven without my extended family. I want my family to know the Lord. And so the more that I see these things approaching, the more I get intense about talking to friends and family and looking for those opportunities, right? So you're going to work tomorrow if you're still working. Some of you are retired, um, but you're going to see friends. You know, family, family events are coming up. You know, next one is, is Labor Day, and I don't know if you get together with family on Labor Day, but I'm already looking forward to Thanksgiving. So I'm going to have family members coming over for Thanksgiving who are not walking with the Lord. And we're going, to, we're going to be having conversations about that. They don't know it, but I know it. <laughs> you know, and it's because I'm not interested in them being left behind, being weighed down with carousing and drunkenness. I'm thinking of specific people in my family that once walked with the Lord and don't anymore. So those are things that, you know, where, where we can apply those. That's the first part of the trumpet judgments. The second part, when we get into chapter 9, it's weird. It's really weird. And so the first part is more on a physical plane. The second part is more on a spiritual plane. And we'll talk about that next time. Let's, let's pray. Get you out of here. And again, Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for, for the fact that, uh, again, you're the God who knows the end from the beginning. You know all things. And, Lord, long before anybody on this planet ever considered anything like an asteroid impact, you wrote about those things. And he, long before anybody ever knew anything, about a bolide, you wrote about those things. Long before they knew anything about chemical reactions that can take place in the atmosphere and the, thing, the cascading events that can take place in the oceans because of these kinds of things. Long before we knew any of that, you wrote about these things. And again, it's because you're the God of the heavens. You're the God of the universe. You're the God who knows all things. It wasn't John that, that, that um, came up with this stuff. It was you, Lord. And uh, you can look into the future and you know exactly what you're going to do. Thank you, Lord, that we have a God who's mighty, a God who's absolutely powerful, a God who knows the end from the beginning, and a God that, um, that knows us. And we have, that, uh, we have a relationship with you. Thank you for your word, Lord. Thank you for these people. Bless them, Lord. Uh, speak through them, uh, speak to them this week and uh, make them more and more like you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.